Good morning. Thank you, Boris, for the kind introduction. I uh, also want to use the chance to thank the committee to invite me here to speak uh, this morning. Uh, the topic I'll present this morning is a new design paradigm for smart chips. In my presentation this morning, first I'll talk about what are the semiconductor computing trends driven by the semiconductor scaling in the last 50 years, and also we'll point out what the key technology to enable this to happen. After that, I'll point out this new technology not only driving the technology application trend, but also create new design challenges. So that's why the, we need a new design paradigm to overcome these new challenges to make our system chip design better. So today, I will share with our uh, idea, preliminary idea, on what the new design paradigm should look like. What's the essential component within this design new paradigm? And also, we will uh, present some of the, our uh, new approaches and results to support this new design paradigm. Then conclude with our concluding remark. If we look at the last 50 years on the computing application, I think semiconductor scaling actually enabled the computing uh, to continue evolve from the early 60s, from the mainframe computing support multiple users to the PC world one PC, one individual, and to right now the mobile world, one person with multiple device. So it's coming uh, probably go even more uh, for the machine to machine. To support this kind of mega trend, there are a few technologies that also need to evolve at the chip level and system design level. So actually the chip design we also find evolve from the 2D design, from the multiple chip within the PCB, evolve to the SOC, so right now, with the requirement of more performance and better system performance, so right now we're going to the 3D technology. So 3D technology, there are several key technology are evolving today. So one is the 3D transistor, like FinFET, FDSOI. And the next one, the 3D stacking, with different technology, with the wafer label bonding stacked together. Or the third one is the 3D IC packaging, using wafer based to improve the system performance. So with the maturity and emerging of this 3D technology, so right now it's going to the next evolution will be the system label integration to get more performance, better form factor in a much larger scale. The first look at the, what are the major components to trigger this the chip design and system design evolution. Let's look at a transistor. So uh, many research uh, Many people are conducting research to find out what should be the next generation transistor beyond FinFET today. So here we list the most, some of the, the device actually published in the literature. So if we took a 3.5 and also Germanic FinFET as example. So with the current data look like a, its characteristic material, material look promised for low voltage and low power optimization. Beyond that, right now, also research working on the electrical characteristic for carbon nanotube and also for graphene. Another key component to enable the technology scaling is the patterning technology. So beyond 193 nanometer single patterning immersion technology, so right now, reverse, inverse lithography and also multi-patterning are already being used in today's production. Point forward, I think EUV in the last few years, we observe steady progress on all the throughput. But most people have some concern, but we already observe good progress on that. So we expect EUV will be in production for technology after N7. Another key technology is 3D packaging. So as the industry focus, uh, integration focus switching from the transistor only to the system level packaging. So 3D label, 3D packaging, IC packaging technology evolved to support this need. So here we show several of the key 3D packaging technology using. So one is on the right, it's a wafer label bounding, so it's more straightforward. And also the vertical stack, stacking, that's the different disruptive technology. Uh, mostly used today, or more popular, effective are the 3D 
I see wafer label based staking. So here we show we use the name COAS and I info that stands for chip on wafer on substrate and integrate thing out. That's the wafer based three D I C technology provided by TSMC. We believe other foundry also provide similar technology. So I will cover more detail on this technology later. So although it's good news, so no matter it's a transistor, 3D packaging, or the patent technology keep evolving to support this kind of technology trend. However, every new technology also introduces new design complexity and new design challenge. For example, when we move first from the 28 high high metal gate first to 20 nanometer, we first introduce the double patent. So when we introduce double patent, they create a new rule. So you need to worry not only about the width the spacing, you only need to worry about whether the component or polygon can be decomposed or not. And those rules will have rippling effect. So this breaks a lot of existing assumptions today. So if you move further from planar device to fin phase devices, right now your design is not continuous, driving stress not continuous anymore. You can only have one fin, two fin, three fin, four fins. It's become digitized. So your design need to think from different way to optimize your design circuit. So there are other new process now coming. So all this the new process now, we need to find out the new design paradigm to quickly overcome these design challenges such that we can realize the benefit it brings to us. And also we find out a lot of new techniques introduced right now. It's not only incremental change or impact to our existing design practice. Some of the technique actually is disruptive. So we need to be have out of box thinking to find out our solution from totally different angle. Some of the assumption even will break out today's assumption. So I point out, uh, show some example today. And also the new technology sometimes today we find out its impact on design is much wider, much larger than before. It covers much wider design stage. So it's time to truly consider top down and bottom up optimization. Otherwise, you cannot fully utilize the benefit this technology provides. And also, we need to think about it's time to provide customized, optimized solutions for different application spec. So in the last 5, 10 years, I think we use design everything based on mobile. But right now, we have a high performance computing, IoT. We have automotive. But their spec is very different from mobile. They deserve different kind of solution. Last one. In the last few years, the new technology evolved. We find out we can leverage this no, those new technology to help us solve new problem on chip design, system design. Uh, so improve our overall chip design and system design quality and also productivity. So first, let's look at uh, what the new challenge bring to us. So when process continued strength provide better scaling. Metal usually be scaled very aggressively. So this aggressively scaling make its resistance increase exponentially, while its total capacity roughly keep the same. But this dramatic increase of uh, resistance on metal will change the behavior when we do the design on delay. So let's look at the how the impact on today's the design. If we compare the back end of line, the metal delay, delay percentage over total delay, this potential increase from roughly 10% at 40 nanometer to more than 20% at N7. This number we expect is going up for N5 because N5 dimension will even smaller. So how can we solve this problem? First, we can rely on process continue to find a new material. I believe the chance is pretty low. So from design side, if you do something, actually, is there any way we can mitigate this problem and find solution? So here I show you an example. So if you look at the top pictures, if we take N7 as example, we want to connect two snail cell separated by 20 micron. If the V resistance we take as one, this metal resistance roughly 50x more. So to improve the delay, the best way, easiest way to move metal up, use low resistance metal. So quickly reduce the resistance. However, you go through more V's. So your delay still increase. Then how to 
reduce wear resistance, we use larger wear or wear array. Then we can, in total, reduce backend of delay by almost 4x or 25x. So by doing that, we do the design on N7, use the approach we just mentioned. So it looks like pretty effective. We can reduce the RC delay for the critical paths at the same level as we did on the 16. So it, but for N5, because metal has been much, much smaller, V is even smaller. So we still, although it's very effective, we still need to find a new knob to further enhance that. So this example tells us from design side, we need to do design in the more in a smarter way to solve this problem. So instead of treat all metal the same, we need to be smart enough to separate two kinds of metal. For high density metal, we use for high density. For low resistance metal, we use for speed enhancement. So this also requires design challenges, design changes. And also this requires EDA enhancement. The good news right now, EDA is aware of this issue. So they are able to optimize their tool to take advantage of both sides. So from the preliminary result, look promising. This the high RC metal resistance issue also impact the uh, SRAM performance also. So if you look at the picture on the right, that's the one line resistance from generation to generation. So from 16 to 10 nanometer, because metal we drive very aggressively, so one line is increased aggressively. So when we move to N7, we got a lesson learned. So actually, we optimize our process and layout to make it to lower resistance. But compared to 16, the one line resistance is still too high. So that's why we change our layout style. We use the double one line to reduce the one line resistance. And find out it's pretty effective so we can go back the, to the same level as 16 on the one line resistance. The other challenge when we move forward is on the patented technology. So multiple patented technology become a must for N10 and N7. Although it's very effective in driving the technology solution scaling, but it also creates new design rule, challenge on the design, especially for its notorious the current decomposition and reporting effect. This effect is global. So even you have two IP, they are both DRC clean, but when you put them together, they, they will trigger each other, may have new violation. So with this kind of new rule features, characteristic and other rule, so we find out when we move from, from one generation to the next generation, we are still able to make IP smaller, stem cell smaller, as we expected. But with this kind of new rule, current rule, or the new pattern rule, our cell utilization rate ratio is actually dropping. Cell utilization means under certain area, how many stem cells you can put in. This number is the higher the better. With this dropping on the ratio, which means your chip area scaling is less than you are supposed to get. So we need to find if there's any way actually we can solve this problem. So we think about the first one, how to avoid this kind of reporting effect is, OK, let's redo our snail cell. So at the boundary, we make some buffer zone, or we adjust the layout pattern to avoid this kind of impact to the boundaries to other cell when they are about. The second one, to make the EDA tool easier to route, just like the picture we show on the left. So original layout, just as easy as we don't do anything. But this layout, you can. Every pin, you have only five access points to access. But if you change it a little bit, you can start an increase to six pin we can access. And also, we find out going to N7, N10, N7, or even going further, how network has much impact on cell utilization rate because the resistance is too high. Right now, power network is much, much denser than before. So, traditional. We just use power trunk for all the layers. But with the power trunk so dense, it's difficult for stem cell to place. There's no way they can place. Limit is flexibility. So that's will cause the retention drop. So is there any way actually we can limit this kind of limitation? So we find out on certain high utilization layers, if we can 
use some new tap style instead of the power trunk style as shown here. We can significantly relax some limitation on the snail cell placement. So by doing this one and also other technique, we are able to move back the cell utilization rate on N7. We believe this technology is also useful for N10, but this data only showed you the data on N7. Another challenge we, for, we see is the, right now everything, uh, everyone is pushing for low power. To do low power, transistor need to be run at a low supply voltage. But transistor running at low supply voltage due to the heroin limitation, delay variation increase exponentially. But this is not the worst. The worst is when you're doing the design at the 0 0.5, a very low supply voltage, your delay and skill distribution become non-Gaussian. This is totally break today's EDA2 assign of assumption, which means if you use existing EDA2 practice to do sign of design 0.5 volt, it's not accurate. So it's any way to solve this problem. So we think about the first one, is any way we can still leverage existing EDA2 capability, minimal impact, minimal enhancements can still get the accurate result at a low supply voltage. So we find out, so for this non-Gaussian distribution, we find out if we can use the two-curve approach, the early curve to cover the short tail, then we use another long, late distribution to cover the long tail. So with this two, tail, two Gaussian curve, we can still cover, really cover those kind of Gaussian behavior. Then we can use existing EDA tool, existing de design methodology, still get pretty decent result. But the way we do science will be a little bit different. So we validate this kind of new approach versus SPICE Monte Carlo simulation on the N7 design. So the blue curve is the delay, net delay distribution using the SPICE Monte Carlo simulation. The red dots are the simulation using existing one curve solution to model the non-Gaussian. So you can see this curve correlation with spice is pretty bad. That, by the way, this data is sign of, we do it sign of at 0 0.5 volt. It's pretty bad on correlation. And also, its result is too optimistic. Then we use the two curve approach as shown on the green dots. So you can see it's pretty close to the Monte Carlo simulation. And the good news, it also bound by the Monte Carlo simulation. Low VDD scaling also have an impact on S3 design. So while the logic part has been reduced, can run at low voltage, we also want S3 part can also be reduced to run, to run at a low supply voltage. So starting from the 20 nanometer, we find out to lower, further lower S3 VCC mean, design assist circuit will be needed. So to further lower the S3 VCC mean, we use the negative bin line approach. And through the last three or four generations silicon data, we find out this technique is pretty effective in reduced or lower the s strand VCC mean by 150 to 200 millivolts. So in addition to that kind of new challenge, we need to think about new approaches to have new assumption on those problem statements and come out with new solution. <coughs> It's also about time to think about top-down and bottom-up optimization. You may ask why it's more critical now. So let me use some example to show you. So as mentioned earlier, technology scaling caused metal resistance increase dramatically on metal and also on beer. This dramatic increase on metal have a big impact on today's power ground network. You will make your design out drop spec more difficult to meet, also cause EM violation on your power network. So we need to see how to solve this problem. So the one on the top left is existing power network, but with the metal resistance getting so high, so they cannot meet the IR, IR drop spec. Right now, the easiest way to add more power trunk. But right now, moving to N7 or N10, right now power trunk is so dense. So if it just add power trunk as easy it is, it will limit the stand cell flexibility, so cause chip area impact. 
The better way is instead of evenly distributed, let's group those power trunks together. So leave larger space for snail cell to place. Let me use this chart to better explain. So today, if you just increase more power trunk density, then for larger snail cell, you cannot place under this power trunk. You'll cause DRC violation. By grouping together, leave a larger space between power trunks, then you give snail cell more flexibility. But this one's still not good enough. Snail cell can only be in place between the power trunks. What if this snail cell is larger? Oh, this space already have other snail cell in place. Then I have to find other spot. This will cause timing difficult to meet. So if we rethink about how to design our snail cell, if we understand how the power trunk network will look like. So within the snail cell, let's leave some empty space there. Then when I place them, I can easily have more flexibility. I can place those snail cell between power trunk or even under the power trunks. So this gives a better flexibility on our design. So this example tells us, chief architect, when you design your power network, you have to think about what's your impact on the implementation. So for IP designer, when you design IP, you have to understand how your chip power network looks like. So I need to optimize the layout to fit the power network. If you don't talk, then the consequence is you don't get all the benefit from the technology scaling. Similarly, also, the, if I look at S-train scaling, why not because we move to FinFET, S-train bit cell size easily determined by gate pitch and also fin pitch. Looking forward, I think it's very difficult to get the same level of scaling as we get before on s and B cell. And also, I think it's not practical to continue push gate pitch or fin pitch very aggressively and take the penalty on yield and manufacturing window. However, we still want to get a better area scaling. So in this, instead of push process, I think from the design side, we have other way we can solve this problem. First look at how we do our stairs, do our S-Train compiler design today. Today, when we do the S-Train compiler, we try to make it to cover as wide spec as possible. So we to cover much wider range of application usage. But this is a good part, it also has the consequence. Consequence is too much redundant circuit in there. So this causes area performance penalty. So in the future, instead of still using the one compiler to meet all the wide range of spec, we will start to think about how to provide more finer grain compiler so it's optimized in area performance for specific segment. So by doing that, we can still push the area a little bit further at the chip level. Now let's look at uh, why we need to do customization design for different applications. Last 10 years, the whole industry are driven by mobile application. So all our design knowledge, all our database are built on mobile. So when we face a new application, we tend to use existing solution to, give, to, to apply to that application. However, we find out use the mobile as it is, it will not be optimized for other application. Sometimes it may not work for other optimization. So it's okay to use mobile as a starting point to do the design optimization, but you have to optimize your circuit specific for any, specific, any application. So for example, if you want to use mobile application solution for automotive, performance power-wise probably look okay, but for automotive, they have stringent requirement on function safety, reliability, and quality. Also, they need to meet the industry standard, ACEQ 100, ISO 26262. Oh. And also, if you want to use the uh, same solution for IoT, IoT, they don't care that much on the performance, but most concern low power, low leakage, low cost. Oh. If you want to consider the high performance computing, they can tolerate on the power leakage, but give me the low leakage, but faster device. Give me the overdrive, I just want to squeeze any performance process can get. So their consideration is very different 
So how it impact our design criteria or design paradigm? So I use the SGN design concept as example to illustrate the change we need to make. So for example, when you do the SGN design, if you want to cover the high-end smartphone, tablet, probably use the most high, high current or uh, high density SGN provide, 60 SGN provide by foundry, it should be fine. But if you want to start to touch into the IoT domain, then probably the high density will be out because that cannot be run as low, low, low supply voltage. You need to use high current with rewire assist. But if you even want to run lower, then you need to consider use 80 or 20 transistor or even logic base itself to meet the requirement. So this chart shows you for different applications, when we're doing the design, we need to have different uh, design approaches to meet this requirement. Next, let's uh, see what the other technology can help us to provide better chip design, cycle time, productivity, and uh, performance, or even the system level. First, I show you the 3D technology. 3D technology has been used by several uh, chip already today to improve overall system performance, form factor, power. But this technology is still very new. Uh, although there is certain approach, certain usage model to use this technology, I believe there are a lot of innovation we can create to better utilize this technology. So today, I will show you existing approach, how existing customer is this is this in product using this technology? But I don't want to limit your ima imagination on those uses only. The purpose is to trigger new innovation, how to better utilize this technology. So first, let's look at the info integrated fingerprint technology. This is a technology used by most mobile application today for better form factor, power, or performance. So there are different approaches you can use. So you can use a large die to just Im improve your form factor uh, on Z dimension and the power. Or you can integrate your logic die with commodity DRAM through the through in, in TIV or through interposer via. Integrate together for a better form factor and also system power and memory bandwidth. Or you can use them further to push down to further enhance your sickness and better system performance. For high-performance computing application, they are using a technology called COAS. Because COAS is, can provide better routing density and also better, better performance. COAS stands for chip and wafer and substrate. So first, you can leverage COAS technology to participate your very huge die into several small die. Still achieve the same performance, but with much better yield. Or you can use this technology to improve your overall system memory bandwidth and performance oh, by integrating your logic die with HPM module, high bandwidth memory module, through COAS. Or you can even integrate your logic die using this technology to have better form factor or performance. And this logic die can be same technology or different technology. So this example just show you what is happening today, but don't limit our limitation on those applications only. So let's think about is there any other way we can change our architecture, we can better utilize this technology. The other technology we find out is very useful is the machine learning. Machine learning had uh, good progress on both the algorithm and the hardware in the last few years. We find out if we leverage the machine learning capability, actually can help us solve some of the most uh, difficult issues in current chip design. So here I show two examples. The first one is showing the most uh, difficult problem we have today is on the DRC or congestion correlation before routing and after routing. So if you look at the picture at the bottom left, that's the correlation map, congestion map, before routing, after routing. So you can see the correlation is not good. The red color means the congestion area. However, before the routing, they think everything is okay. But after routing, you find out a lot of DRC violation, you cannot fix it. 
Uh, so this caused a last minute table surprise. So we find out if we leverage the machine learning algorithm, provide the training data, so we are able to develop the predict model at the pre-routing stage. So you can check the curve, the picture at the right, bottom right, the two colors. So at the pre-routing stage, we are able to forecast, predict the routing congestion after routing. So although the dot a little bit more than the after route, we do that on purpose because we want to make sure in the pre-routing stage, a little bit conservative, but it covers 98% of the violation we will see in the real implementation. So by doing that, actually, we find out it helps us a lot reduce the last minute surprise, reduce our iteration before and after routing. Another example is the clock gating. Clock gating approach is very effective in reducing the chip power. It's been widely used today. However, how to optimize clock gating cell is always challenging. From the architecture of arterial label, it's pretty easy because there's only very few clock gating cells. But after synthesis, after implementation, these few clock gating cells expand to more than 10,000, even 20,000 clock gating cells. It's impossible for human beings to provide sufficient constraint for those 10,000 clock gating cells manually. Then the only thing we can do is provide few constraints apply globally and take the over design consequence. We find out by leverage all the machine learning technique, we are able to help to generate the predict model and set all the constraint for each individual clock gating cell. By doing that, we apply the existing ARM code on Sense 7 and go through the machine learning model prediction and set specific constraint, we are able to improve the clock frequency by 150 megahertz. Not only that, we also reduce the total negative time slack by 50%. This one can be re reused for power reduction. So as the transistor, testing technology, 3D packaging, and other techniques still evolving and to support the technology trend, I think it's time for us to have our design paladin evolve too. Today, we present our preliminary idea on what the new design paladin should look like. We believe we only cover a very small portion of that. So I want to use this chance to call your attention such that we can work together to come out with more innovation to solve this problem together to provide better performance and result for our chip design and system design in the future. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you.